Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's work session for the Planning Board for May 14th, 2009. Uh, we have one item on the agenda. Item A, discussion on possible zoning amendments to permit senior housing facilities in the Office Research OR District, subject to certain conditions. This session continues the Planning Board's review of a City Council referral. This work session is a continuation of the Planning Board work session held on April 30th. Well, I would just turn it over to staff. Okay. Rick, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, the, uh, the last uh, work session we had a um, uh, draft, oh, red line, marked up copy of the draft uh, zoning ordinance for senior housing. And we, we went through, discussed it. There was a presentation from um, the proponents. Um, there was some discussion. We decided, uh, I believe, that uh, the board decided that you wanted to have a follow-up work session to, to discuss some of the issues, continue discussion of some of the issues, and, um, and see if we could resolve something and come to, come to a, um, something that you would feel comfortable um, taking action on. And uh, in the interim, uh, I have um, gone further with this draft. I have not submitted another version to you in the interest of not confusing you because there's so many drafts float, floating around. But what I'd like to do tonight is go through some, um, some recommended changes, and conceptual recommended changes are going to be uh, mostly on the, um, on the screen. And we can, just as a presentation of, of some of the issues that I see, that some of the key issues that I see. And we've discussed some of these. Uh, we had a meeting the other day with the proponents, so, so they're aware of, of these ideas, and, and uh, we've had some, a little bit of back and forth on it. And I expect that, if you wish, you can ask them to, um, to, to respond uh, if, if, you have, if you have questions about it. Um, but what I'd like to do right now is just move up to the, uh, to the screen and just go through a, a fairly brief presentation. There, are, there aren't that many issues. It's a limited number of issues that I've identified, um, and I think we can just go from there. So Great. That, with that, I'll move up. Thank you. This, I don't know if this is on. I don't think so. He's saying it is. He says it's yeah, on. Yeah, he says it is. Okay, great. So um, the, first, the first major change um, is just in terms of the uses. We, at the last draft, uh, we talked about senior housing being what this, uh, the condition use permit was, was, is for, and it could be for uh, any type of senior housing facil facility which would include assisted living, congregate care, continuing care, retirement community, independent living units, and the on-site workforce housing. And at, at the last uh, work session, we really focused in on continuing care, retirement communities, the mix of independent living, assisted living, and um, skilled nursing care. And uh, what I've recommended here is, is, is one change is that the, basically to limit the conditional use permit to conditional uses to the continuing care retirement community or to an assisted living residence. Um, you know, if, if an assisted living residence provides a different, it doesn't provide the full range, but it is, it's a different type of use that is, uh, provides supportive uh, services to residents. Um, that independent living units would be allowed only if they're in a, a CCRC, a continuing care retirement community. And things that were missing from the last draft were definitions of assisted living unit. There was a, there was a definition of assisted living residence, which was a standalone thing, but not an assisted living unit in a CCRC uh, or a nursing care unit. So those things, I suggest, um, be added. Um, and also, there was there were a couple of different versions back and forth between our original draft and the, the response from the proponents um, about phasing and the relationship of different types of, of units. I think the, what we'd like to have, uh, what we'd recommend having in the in the ordinance, is a requirement that the assisted living and nursing care. Uh, units have to be developed at a rate at least proportional to their rate in the build-out. So if, uh, if there are 50 units of, I don't remember the numbers that were proposed, but 50 units compared to 410 units, you have to maintain that proportion. It doesn't mean you can only do that. You could build all of the assisted living and nursing units at once <coughs> at the beginning uh, and follow up with the independent living units. But the idea would be that 
we wouldn't build all of the independent living units and, and save the assisted living and nursing for later. Are there any questions about this, these two ideas? Um, is, it, is it actually constructed or is it permitted? I mean, because I've been involved in, in projects of building this, and they're usually entirely separate buildings, uh, different building materials um, because of the, the, the different um, building code requirements for the type of care. So oftentimes you'll build um, the independent living separately from the, the uh, dependent living. And so I guess the developer would have to physically construct the, they're really going to have to start the, you're basically mandating they start the dependent living first. Or at the same time. Well, oftentimes it doesn't make sense construction-wise to start two areas of the project, um, um, yeah, different footprints. I just, yeah. I'm wondering about the unintended consequences of this. You know, um, I don't know if it's a big deal, or but it just. Do you it, have a concern about it? Yeah, I, I do. In that, I mean, most construction projects they would they would build one portion of the building first, or and then move on to the next. And this, we're mandating that, that it be the assisted living portion that, that they build first. And I wonder if that's getting our hands too involved in the day-to-day in -day operations of construction. Um, and I wonder if, it, if just just permitting, they have to, you know, they'd have to get their, their their building their building permit at the same time would be enough of a of a watchdog in that. Cindy, um, I would suggest two things. One, maybe Rick, you could just address what we're trying to avoid, and then maybe at the end of your presentation, when the board's done discussing, we could have them respond to what. Sure. how they feel about it. Okay, so that was just the, the point. Was the idea would be that we not be left with a development that was entirely independent living and that the nursing yeah. assisted would never go. Oh. And, and if I could just ask, excuse me, John, if, if you want to maybe take some notes and then at, at some point we'll give you a, a form where you can address all these items at once. I think that's the best way to do it. So, excuse me, John. Uh, I'm a little confused. When you talk about uh, at least proportionate, is there some kind of proportion that you're a ratio or if there is a proposal a specific proposal for if the condition use permit says we're going to do 400 years. x number independent living y number assisted living z number nursing that that the that the actual development have at least that proportion of assisted living and nursing and not yeah, fall below that okay so ml i just had a question about the concept of a nursing unit because i'm not sure that that applies Can you use your mic ml yeah sure um, I mean, it, it's here, I mean, where, where you're talking about it here, and it also comes up in the density element of this. Is a nursing unit a bed, a room? It's typically a bed. Okay. It could be a bed, it could be a bed, it's frequently a bed in a room, like a, a single bed in a single room. But it's possible there could be, you know, doubles. But the rooms are much smaller than an assisted living unit. Okay. The living unit is much smaller than the independent living unit. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. Um, so, in terms of buildings, what the, the there was a proposal. The initial proposal uh, was that it be four story, allowed to be up to four stories or sixty feet. And this is a recommendation that, that we're making that it be that the maximum height be uh, four stories or fifty feet. Um, and, and one thing that's related to that is the initial um, recommendation said that roofs had to be pitched roofs. And um, that is, you know, in keeping with a New England type of character, um, but it, it also increases the height of the <coughs> roof because of the way we measure roofs. Uh, you, you um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me go back before we get to that. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the way we measure roofs is the... Um, uh, to the midpoint of a gabled or pitched roof, and so you could so a 60 foot pitched roof would actually be higher than 60 feet. 50 foot pitched roof would be higher than 50 feet. Um, so we're suggesting that you could do a pitched roof, but remo removing the requirement for a pitched roof, and then because parking is proposed to be provided um, below the building, uh, which is a good thing, um, but we want to make sure that it's also a a, a building that is a, a pedestrian accessible building. Uh, so we're suggesting that at least 50% of the perimeter of the building, the exterior walls, be habitable space, not uh, parking. And one of the things that was discussed at the last meeting was the fact that the topography on this site would allow them to walk in at one level in front of the building and drive into a lower level at the back of the building um, as, as a possibility. So that was just a, a, a way to just def define that. 
And these are a couple, a few images that, that, that uh, Mark Stebbins sent uh, of developments that are, um, that I guess they've been involved with, that are essentially the, that meet, would meet this four-story, 50, um, 50 foot limit. So, and these have parking below the building. So this is not, say, not saying that this is the kind of building, but this is the, this is the scale of building that we might be talking about. Um, a couple of developments um, left in place is, I believe, condos in um, Watertown, oops, and then uh, Hemswood in Chestnut Hill and Brookline, and then uh, Endicott Green in Danvers. So these are the, the kinds of buildings. Not to say this is what it's going to look like. And this one, by the way, does have the pitched roof. These have the flat roof. So they're, they're to show you a variety of finishes, a variety of roof styles, but they all would fall within that 50-foot um, uh, four-story building with parking below. Um, now, in terms of building setbacks, the initial proposal um, was that uh, the buildings would have to be set back 50 feet from parcel boundary. We had suggested uh, 150 feet from a residential district because there are different districts surrounding here. In some cases, 50 foot feet from a boundary might be appropriate. Other places, it might not be appropriate. Uh, we've had some discussion back and forth over the last couple of days about whether that could be 50 feet or 100 feet, and I, and I think that there's some flexibility there. I just wanted to show you just to give you a sense. Um, this is, if I can stop this, let's see. Um, so, so right now, this is the existing area, and, and there's, there's about 175 feet between these two buildings. Here, this is the, this is Islington Street. Uh, this is the WBBX road. This is the railroad track. The, it, the railroad track has been highlighted with that yellow dotted line. So right now, uh, there's an existing um, barn-like building out on the property that is 175 feet across the railroad right-of-way from from this house and 120 feet from this, this uh, railroad line. And the railroad line, according to the zoning map, is the zoning district boundary. So that would be the, uh, the relevant dimension that we're talking about. Um, sorry. So, so right now, there's a, about a 120-foot setback. Uh, this would be the 100-foot setback, roughly, approximately, from the, from the zoning line, which again is this. So that, that would be the 100-foot setback line there. And then just kind of, this is really rough, <laughs> but trying to try to apply the site plan to these setbacks um, and scale it in. So here's the WBBX road. Um, here's the railroad line coming down like this. This is a 100-foot setback. So, so as it is right now, it appears that the plan would essentially be the 100-foot setback from the zoning line, or the, and which is also about a 50-foot setback from the sideline because the, the railroad right-of-way appears to be about 100 feet. According to, according to the, uh, town's, the city's assessor's maps, it's about 100 feet wide. So. So there's about uh, 50 feet of right of way on either side of the railroad line. So, um, so this is this would represent uh, approximately a 100 foot setback from the zoning district boundary, and that's just to give you a sense of, of uh, how this how this would all relate to that to the railroad line and to the surrounding neighborhood. So, oh, and one of the points that was made, um, just for your consideration, is that the further you push the buildings back from the property line the uh, less ability there is to put the parking on this side, of the, on the Borthwick Avenue side of the buildings, and, and the parking lot would have uh, lighting. So while the buildings might have an impact on the, on the neighborhood, moving the parking, oops, moving the parking around to, the, to this side of the buildings might have more of an impact on the neighborhood because of, of lighting. It's one of those things you have to balance out, balance out the light impacts versus the proximity of the buildings to the neighbors, mm. something to think about. Um, we had a, a proposal in there. Uh, we went back. We had a couple of different ways of looking at um, required open space. We're suggesting that minimum usable open space be about at least 40% of the developable area, and the developable area would be the upland area of the lot, the area excluding the, um, the wetland area. And also uh, we're suggesting, and, and, it, and it seems to fit in with the site plan and, and the proponents feel like it, it would work, that at least 40% of the required parking spaces be provided I get control of this. Be provided below the buildings. In other words, no more than 60% of the required parking should be in surface lots. Any questions? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't stop. I didn't let you stop on the last one. But any, any questions up to now? I, I just have one question. Did you do a guesstimate as to whether that works given their the 40%, 60%? Yeah. Uh, we got an indication. They can you can ask them, but we got an indication that it would work. Uh, 
I think this is probably the biggest thing and biggest point of discussion. Uh, we uh, strongly feel, and we've talked to the fire department about it and, and got their input on it, that there should be at least two separate access points that are full access points to existing streets, not, not one full access point and one, and one emergency access point. And that there should be the possibility of continuous vehicular access between the two street access points. And that although uh, the streets may be private, and there li will likely be private streets internal in the project, that there should be, I'll go ahead, there should be sufficient right of way reserved for a, for a <coughs> public street. Now, this is just looking at their site plan. Just want to give you a sense of what this means. So that there's, it doesn't mean that every internal road has to be big enough to be a public street in the future, but it does mean that there should be a way uh, for vehicles to get from uh, one side of the project to the other, continuous flow, and uh, uh, that there should be along that, that axis uh, the res re reservation of enough land so that if in the future there had to be a public street, that it would be, um, it would be, you have that, the possibility of doing it a street that conforms to city, reg city regulations. Mm -hmm. Is that <clears throat> so, I mean, just to be clear, that's basically requiring that there be a permanent access point on and off Islington Street? Yes. Well, in this case, in this case, with this site plan, that's what, that's what it would be. I mean, if there, if there were another way to do it, where you had, could come off two different streets in a different way, way without going through Islington. But looking at this site plan, we'd basically be saying that this, that this access would not be an emergency access. It would be a, 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 a full access. And can I ask you to talk a little bit more about your thinking on that? Well, we talked to the fire department, and they, they um, the, the uh, input was that there was concern that if you uh, well, there's, there's, there are actually two separate issues here. One was one issue is there's a continuous access through, and it's the idea of uh, not having people have to go all the way around to get with you know like ambulances or something like that go all the way around. And there should be a continuous way through so that somebody, so that an emergency vehicle didn't come in here and then have to turn around and go all the way around to get to the hospital. And that's just you know just making sure that there's okay. a continuous vehicular access that way. And then so that's the that's the point about the continuous through access. I guess from a planning point of view, uh, that's more the emergency services point of view. From a planning point of view, the idea was if all the people are going to be in this, in this part of the, the uh, development, the development really is going to be on Islington Street. It's going to be visible from Islington Street and so forth. People, are going to, people who live there are going to want to go downtown that way. They're, they're, they're going to want to leave that way and go downtown. And it just doesn't make sense to have somebody who's living here go all the way out there and go all the way down to go go down to, you know, the Plaza 800 or something like that. It just it makes much more sense from a planning point of view to, to have to use the front door, the real front door, as the front door. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's kind of two issues there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the sort of the longstanding issue there. Um, it, in thinking of this as both this site and not this site, thinking of it in the abstract, you're talking about two separate access points that are to two different streets. Yes. Well, I, you know, given the given the trade-offs, I mean, I, I'm not sure why we would require that in zoning. I think that would be the kind of thing to be discussed during approval, because there are then definite trade-offs to that neighborhood and to that what that street is that um, I mean it doesn't make sense to me to require something when there are that without like an impact? yeah without thinking of the trade-offs and the impacts to just go ahead and require it I'm, I'm not saying that very well but um, instead of you know, saying if, well, two separate access points, I can understand that because one thing is blocked and you want to be able to go around an alternate way or whatever. But to then have to require that that particular access point is the one. Oh, no, no, the, the, this, this is, this is I, I, I misunderstood you. This is an illustration on this site plan of how you would have two access points to public streets with continuous flow between them. It doesn't mean that it, it must saying. be that. It doesn't mean that it has to be those two access points. And it doesn't mean that it has to be to Islington. Yeah, if there's another street. Couldn't it loop theoretically? Right. I mean, couldn't it, couldn't it loop 
to fourth work? If you will, and yes. So it doesn't have to be two separate streets. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. One, one of the issues here is the, the concern about uh, two at-grade railroad crossings, the possibility of something happening that could block one of them. And maybe, Rick, can you just point out where those are? Because if people are watching this, they aren't going to necessarily know about so the railroad. So there's one, one railroad track that's <coughs> right along here, just right where the arrow is crossing, that white line. <coughs> and the other railroad line comes here and kind of comes down like this. So it borders the, borders the site. Those are the two issues. Tony and then Anthony. Be before going ahead with this particular, I mean, I'm really, really concerned hearing this. I would be interested in hearing from a, a traffic engineer and their thoughts. I mean, my thought, when I first saw that, I was like, well, I wonder if we could have uh, all the residential parking have access to Islington and staff parking have access to Borthwick and maybe have an uh, emergency gate between the two of those. But I'm just concerned about people exiting Borthwick Avenue through this development as a, as a, a means of traveling to Borthwick Avenue. Don't think. Oh, I see what hmm. you mean. Cut off. Yeah, but yeah. I don't cut, cut through. Cut through. But why? That, that, that's the Borthwick Avenue, it, I think, is pretty busy of a, of a road. And so is it Islington. Yeah. Anthony, do you have Yeah, I mean, I, talking about the potential of, well, they could be on different roads. I mean, it, with this development, it would be these two access points, right? I mean, there's there's no other roads that they're going to, mm -hmm. it would be Borthwick and Islington. And I mean, it, it just, it's somewhat concerning to me as well, just because I think the amount of traffic you'd be putting I'm focused more on Islington Street that you'd be putting on Islington Street would be significant. I mean, this is a pretty dense development. And I mean, I think just from a traffic safety point, but also mm -hmm. I think one of the things we heard when we met in December uh, was the residents there were very concerned about this suddenly becoming a main access point to this. And one of the things I thought we sort of at least were talking about two or three weeks ago was the idea that Islington Street really wouldn't be an access point to this project. It would all be That's through right. Borthwick, but it would be through Islington right. this way. Uh, Cindy and then uh, Councilor Dwight. Um, and maybe, Rick, you want, well, two things. One, everybody remember Atlantic Heights. One road in, problem on the bridge, no way out, emergency road had to be built to get out of there. Big issue. We, we hardly ever, I mean, I don't know if we have ever, Atlantic Heights may be the only example where we would allow such a long road in, one way in, one way out, with a whole lot of people who, in this case, are senior citizens, some of them well and some of them not so well, uh, presumably over time. It would be very unusual that, you know, we would allow that. And the reason I think it, and, and maybe Rick wants to address this too, to, to address it in zoning up front versus site review, I mean, we would address it at both, but, you know, you want to be really clear and upfront at a time when you have more control, which is under zoning, not so much under site review. And I, we've talked internally about this whole cut through issue, and we certainly don't want to see that happen. And I think Rick may want to address how that can be taken care of through site design. But also, you, you need to think about this. This isn't um, you know a place where everybody gets out of work at five o'clock and everybody's streaming out of there at the same time. People live there. It's it's going to be and and they've done some traffic studies, so they they have that data and they've presented some of that to us. Um, so the trip generation is not going to be of the same sort of peak hour thing where everybody's jumping up, going to work, or a workplace where everybody's getting out of work and leaving at the same time. And, and you can't assume that, one, everybody's going to leave at the same time or that everybody's going to go in the same direction. The nice thing about two ways in and out is you distribute the, the flow. I think, I think that the, um, in, terms, in terms of the uh, you know, preventing this from being a cut through, I think there are, there are many ways to do it. I think the, the, from, the, from the emergency safety point of view, the, um, the, the policy or design of the fire department is to um, make sure that there's, there aren't obstructions going from one side to the other. Um, and the one way you could do it, and there are many ways you could do it, you could do, um, and I, I, you know, I don't want to design the site, but I can imagine uh, you know, doing, a, doing some kind of roundabout here that slows people down, but it's a mountable roundabout so that fire trucks can go over it or ambulances can go over it. You could do it uh, in terms of uh, making this more like a, uh, a, a, um, you know, a traditional street pattern so you might have you might come in with a stop sign and make a left and make a right, and you know, a couple of stop signs, internal stop signs that basically slow people down. There's all sorts of things you could do that would be to, to make it less attractive uh, as a cut through. 
but the, I think from a, so, so, and I want to separate the two issues of the emergency access cut through, um, you know, through, through uh, uh, continuous access from one side to the other uh, and the issue of uh, all the people who are living down here and um, may want to walk to a store, may want to get in a car and drive to a store, uh, and that, that, that it's just to isolate them here. Uh, because if you if you don't if you don't let them go out this way, then they're basically isolated here, and they go out this way and go down that way. It's I think it's l less uh, of a good public policy uh, point of view than it is than, than to mm. actually allow them to be part of the community. Oh. Uh, Councillor Dwyer and then well, David. There'd be, there'd be no. I, obviously, we want to separate the two, and I don't. Mm. I certainly was talking about emergency access. Mm. I think that makes sense. No problem with walking scooting, doing whatever. I mean, once we get sidewalks out there. Um, so, the, you know, that would be fine. I, it's not very far to, if you're driving, it, it's not like they're isolated. It's not really very far. You, we're not really putting much of a hardship on, on people to not have them be able to go out their back door, it seems to me. And it's that kind of trade-off that I think we need to wrestle with mm -hmm. rather than Free decide. Uh, I think David had a comment. And then I was just going to suggest that if you're in a site review and uh, TAC is looking at it, it's going to be very significant that you have a large population concentration in one area and they can't get to the adjacent services. These people may not walk, especially. Right. Uh, and what you're doing by forcing them up, directing them towards Borthwick is you're now sending them more than likely to the Route 1 bypass, which is not in great condition. Then we're going down Cottage Street or down Bartlett Street. Then we're asking them to go into some intersections that we know are already problematic. It would probably be better for the traffic patterns if they could actually go out, turn left, and actually make it into the Plaza 800 and what have you and do their business and or have the option of walking. But Cindy mentioned uh, Atlantic Heights, and I don't think many board members were here when that bridge failed, and we had to overnight put an emergency crossing, and the only way we were able to do it was, is really because of Mahoney, the landowner, saying yes, and that emergency access was used for two years. Here, you're using your master plan, you're using what you think is best for the city. We can anticipate what some of the issues are. And I think it behooves us to take a look at that. And I would also add, if this were being developed as office research with office buildings, you might very well be looking at it too for right. that use. So it's not right. it's not unique, but it has to be considered. Right. But uh, but yeah. turning left onto Islington out of that spot given the sight lines, I mean I mean there are real trade offs there and given the amount of time and all of that, I, I don't think it's just a foregone conclusion. That's my only point. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Um, you know what that road is like right now. And, you know, good luck turning left onto Islington. Uh, it, but that could also be used then. Why are we introducing this use there? Well, but it's sort of. Every, I mean, ac every action has to reaction. Right. But, but let's say that driveway, that driveway coming out. Who's to say, for example, in the Islington Street corridor that you can't do XL decel lanes? Perhaps it will meet the warrant for a traffic light. You know, and it's, for example, Beverly Hill Road. Look at how that's changed. There were no lights there 10 years ago. Now we got two, and we're probably looking at a third. Right. That's what's going to happen when you introduce this type of development and you have the person and the applicant that is here that's most responsible. This is the time to discuss it. But isn't our process, in fact, to discuss it rather than to determine in advance? Yeah, I don't think anyone's trying to determine it, but I think you've got to really look at it. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. certainly agree. We're dialoguing. Yeah. Yeah. Paige, did you have a comment? Sustainability. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I guess, um, it's sort of a follow-up to all of it. I, I, I feel ambivalent because I can totally understand the perspective of, you know, as a resident needing, wanting, logically, to have access to Islington from there. Um, but I would agree with what other people have said about, you know, we've heard very, very clearly from Islington Street residents, you know, those of us that went to the Islington Street 
you know, planning discussion a few months ago, you know, we heard how we're already pretty maxed out on traffic there. So, you know, we just need to keep that in mind. I think that, you know, if we're going to move forward with this, the traffic is going to be a key issue, you know, load, timing, as you said, the left turning, um, you know, there are a lot of issues, I think, with it. E e even though, obviously, from the perspective of somebody living there, it makes total sense. Yeah, it doesn't take that long to go around, but it would be kind of annoying, probably. So, um, you know, what kind of, what is the substantial public benefit when you're adding hundreds, whatever, a lot of cars on a daily basis to a really small road that's already pretty maxed out for, for traffic load? Amal, did you have a question? I, I wanted to uh, address a couple of things. One is the concept of doing this as a zoning as opposed to a site review. I think something that Rick said is very informative, which is the orientation of the site looks toward Islington Street. I'm not saying that we have to therefore approve anything, but I think it is a stretch to think that this site is logically fed by Borthwick. And I, 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 so, so that's the first thing. From a planning perspective, I think that the zoning has to consider that. Do we have to bless or imprint that? Maybe not, but I think we have to stop pretending like we're not going to be using Islington as a real access point. Go ahead. You, you. Well, I want the railroad track in my backyard, not my front yard. So I'm not sure that. I'm but it's not in sure. both. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, really, I, I mean, that's what the landscaping is attempting to do. Yeah. That's another, I mean, uh, those are all debatable things. I, I think that you've got a site that is probably, well, I, I think this access issue is a zoning point. That, that, that's really what I'm saying. Um, and then the second point, from a substantial public benefit perspective, I, to the extent this site gets developed, especially in a senior mode, I think integration with the community is a critical component, and the only way to integrate is to have access be accessible. So I, um, to, to the chair's point about having accessible recreation areas, if you're asking families and kids to come in from Borthwick, you're going to see less utilization of those public spaces than if it's coming from Islington. So. I move it just ahead one slide because that's a really good segue into the next slide. Uh, before which is really you, meant to open uh, discussion about this. Yes, Tony, did you have a comment? Or? Well, just until recently, I don't think this parcel of land even had access to Borthwick. This this was an Islington Street parcel. Sure. So actually, until recently, I don't think it had access to Islington Street. Right. <laughs> so uh, let me just because uh, I guess the question is, you know, public public benefit. That's the word that. Uh, and I'll just raise, uh, I guess we've talked about it in a number of different ways and we've, the, the board has kind of discussed it and, and gotten a message out to the, the developers. They've come back with different versions of it. Public benefit has, we've talked about affordable housing, we've talked about playing fields, we've talked about a train station, we've talked about a senior center. So I think that, you know, if, if it's important if we're going to be talking about public benefit to, to focus on what kind, of, what, is, what is the public benefit that, oh, what is the public benefit that we're looking at? I get to learn how to use this. Um, what is the public benefit that we're looking for? And uh, what is a, come on. Um, what is a realistic, it is, pause. Uh, what, is, what is a realistic, what's meaningful public benefit? Uh, and what is feasible? And that point about um, public access, if, if this is going to be, you know, if this is the area that we're talking about as a, primary public benefit areas, trails or recreation or playing fields or whatever, uh, people need to get into it. They need to find a place to park uh, if they're going to be coming from a distance. So I, I guess the, 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 that kind of builds on that question about where the access is, where are people coming from and how are they getting there. So I think that we, and, and I'm not necessarily convinced that there, and I'm obviously not a planning board member, but I. I, I'm not convinced that there needs to be a separate public benefit um, that is that we define in extraction. But if there is, um, it, it really needs to be, it, it can't be <coughs> spurious, it can't be illusory. It, it has to be a meaningful benefit. People have to be able to get there and use it and participate. So that's, I guess, we didn't, don't have an answer here. Um, and so this is really meant for you to be, to have you know something to think about and to look at and perhaps raise your opinions about, about that. Cindy? 
And just relative to that, one thing that really struck me the last time I looked at this was I thought, oh, playing field, that's great. Then I thought, well, everyone's going to drive, want to drive there, mm -hmm. so there needs to be a place for them to park. Well, there's not room there to park. So we need to think about what's a realistic public benefit. Is it space that we want to somehow reserve for, you know, 10 or 20 years down the road, a train station? Uh, or, or is it nothing? As Rick says, it, does it really make sense to have a public benefit of that type here? Or is the public benefit that we as a board are going to recommend to the council we need this type of housing in town? One of the public benefits is taxes. It's one that's been presented to us a number of times that this is a big tax benefit. Another one is that we're providing a housing resource that doesn't exist right now. So there are, even though, the, even though they're, they're not separate benefits from the actual essence of the development, there are some public benefits here that you have to balance against the public costs of increased traffic, maybe some increased services, and so forth. And so you're going to be doing that balancing test. But I guess the question is, does there need to be a separate public benefit that is not related to the development? Hmm. A part of the idea of providing senior housing. And if so, what do you want? Is that a question? It's a question. It's a number of questions. I think it's several questions. <laughs> I think that may be one of the loose ends that may not get tied up tonight, mm -hmm. but I think we're all in agreement that we do want some sort of public benefit. My guess is this site has a different public benefit than maybe a more urban site. Um, I can think of a thousand possibilities that would excite me for this site, i.e. walking trails or, you know, if a grandparent or a kid can go, they can go for a walk or right. maybe snowshoe or something like that. But um, exactly what it is, what type, um, I don't know, I don't know. And remember that this, this is being written, the zoning ordinance will not be writ being written specifically for, specifically for this site necessarily, it's written for a site that is within an office research district that's within a half a mile of a hospital. So it really is for this type of site that we're, that we're drafting this. And so I think that the, um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, if, if you, how you quantify in your, in your zoning, a public benefit that you are leaving open-ended. Tony? This, this may just be warm and fuzzies, but um, the, I mean, the concern, my overlying concern on this project has been, or this proposal has been uh, the, uh, the, we're an older community. The front page of the paper today says we're even getting older um, and not any younger. So if the public benefit involves something with the younger generation, that's why, in my mind, it was playing field or something like that. Again, the warm and fuzzy. It just, it just makes me feel better about the offsetting of, you know, are we providing a, um, we're pr creating a draw to raise our average age in the, in the community. Can we create a draw to lower it, you know? Warm and fuzzy. Cindy? Mr. Warm and fuzzy. And I guess what it comes <laughs> back to for me is I think that's great theoretically, and I originally thought it might be great in practice, but. I have a hard time envisioning it. Say we put a playground out there. It's fine if the, the grandkids visiting the grandparents are using it. Then that's a private facility. But realistically, am I going to go get my kids, put them in the car, drive from across town, park somewhere, and use that mm -hmm. playground? That, that's my thought. Uh, the more I've thought about this is what could we realistically do that would be feasible on this private mm -hmm. property? Is there enough private road? Well, is there enough space for? I mean, the the lacrosse team practices on a half a field, you know, over at, at um, the park on on uh, South Street. Um, is there more space for that? Because they just have a field, you know, where the community uses it for for you know corporate baseball games or whatever. Who knows? You know? That that was my thought. Excuse me, uh, counts. But is to, to Cindy's point, if we do something that is. Two to 102. I don't want to see a playground out here. That's not what I want to see. I'd like to see something that's a multi use that you could walk a two year old or you could take your grandmother for a walk or have just a, an open field that I don't know how you, you, you schedule it. You have an ultimate frisbee on Sundays or something that everybody can use. I think more elderly people are walking, they're biking, uh, that sort of thing. So that, that's what I would envision is something that hits all spectrums, not, not something that may just target a certain age. So. Well, I think we have some good analogs to that. A creek farm is an example of that. You know, that um, is not a place that takes more than 10 cars or so at a time, yet lots of people walk there. You can easily bike there. Um, 
the there are lots of pockets of things like that in our community. I think Creek mm. Farm is very appreciated by people who use it. Jones Avenue, the Jones Avenue area is the same. You know, you never see more than one or two people if you're in those places, but they are what they are and they provide an open space for that area, a wildlife habitat. They're great at all seasons and they don't, ex you know, to, I mean, Creek Farm's such a good example because the parking lot is small for that very purpose. That's a good point. So, Sorry for beating this one, but I really want, the, the concern I have about senior housing is that it gets mothballed and set apart from the rest of the community. And I think Portsmouth is successful in terms of its developable space because of the integration of different uses. So the thing that concerns me from a zoning perspective is that, and I, I keep calling it a meaningful community interface, that this not be set apart from the community. Um, you know, I think about the housing authority houses on Rockland, is it? Yeah. You know, right there in, in a neighborhood, I think that works much better than having them at the outskirts of town. So that's, that's something that I'd like people to consider. Any other uh, comments or questions at this point? Um, shall I just leave this up for now? Do you, what, do you How do you want to handle the rest of the? Yeah, I'd like to get a little bit of dialogue if we could here, and then maybe just ask the uh, the applicant to just touch upon some of the points. Maybe it'd be helpful. Is there a better slide so that we could kind of leave it on that? We have. Um, so that, have you know, this, just as which is an aerial photograph, and then we just have the. Their site plan and the, the, another version of this. I think probably that one's probably the best. This one? Yeah, that one is the best. Yeah. Um, do we want to get a couple of questions or do we want to have the applicant touch upon some of the responses that maybe they have and then you can kind of take it from there, John? I have a question that I was not going to like. But um, does anyone troubled at all by the proximity of those, the size of those buildings to the, resident, the residential neighborhood. I guess it's my HDC roots that you have these, I, I'm not opposed to the project, but I, I'm just, as I look at it, I'm concerned about this pretty massive institutional buildings going up within a hundred feet of a, of a pretty, Rural, um, rural character in a way, old-fashioned Portsmouth neighborhood. Cindy, let me just show uh, something for, for you. Uh, I just throw that out, and uh, you know, I I am to an extent, John. You know, I mean, I put myself in the houses, the people that are on Islington Street, but that is balanced with that by right, somebody can develop big, tall buildings right there now, um, through you know, uh, right. office research, and and that's what it's balanced with, mm. um, that that it is zoned for what it's zoned now. Um, and I guess what I like about this is it gives this board more control, which is why we've put a lot of teeth in this um, draft conditional use zoning so that we do have a lot more control, I think, than we would have under office research. And remember, I was reminded of this this week that by one of my fellow staffers that if, if it gets as far as this conditional use overlay zoning being adopted, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to get this mm -hmm. because the underlying zone, OR, still exists. So mm -hmm. nothing That's may right. happen for five years, and five years from now, office research may get mm -hmm. built there. Mm -hmm. So something sooner or later probably is going to get mm -hmm. built there, and, and I would prefer in some ways to have more control over that. And so it's going to be we, massive is what you're saying? Well, they're going to be big buildings there, whether they are office buildings by right under the zoning or residential, and, and maybe Rick can comment on how big versus the, how the big. The office research would allow 60-foot buildings. We're proposing 50-foot here. And I just want to, I have a couple of photographs here. You can, I'm not sure you can see it very clearly, but there's a building right here. And that's a um, barn. two and a half story barn. So that's, that's uh, so if you added, if the, so the, the building, and this is a little bit further back than is proposed in the site plan. It's a little bit further away from the street than is proposed in the site plan for the, uh, for the, for the senior housing. So if you can imagine that the buildings would be somewhere in this height and a little bit closer than that building, that's, that's really what we're looking at. Right. 
uh, for this. I, I have another one that is actually this is the here's the railroad track. Mm -hmm. So think about 100 feet back from that railroad track. Mm -hmm. That's where the buildings will be. But it's kind of you know sheltered by some woods. Um, and then I have this one. This is a one and a half story building right back in there. That is uh, so so the the height. I'm sorry. This is the two and a half. This is the two and a half. I'm sorry. So that that's the height right there. So the previous one that I showed you was a one and a half, and that so that the building is something like that. So that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of um, um, the the impact on the community. Mm -hmm. So it's it's close. It's not. I don't think at this point it's overpowering, but it's it would be another ten feet ten feet higher to be a potential office. Yeah. Council Dwyer. Well, I mean, I think that is a good point, and it may speak to something around landscape buffer, or something that we want to, um, you know, as part of that would be part of site discussion. But I mean, one of the characteristics of that property, it seems to me, is that you do have because you've got some nice stands of trees, or you've got some sort of built-in buffer, but you could also add to that to do the screening that might be necessary to break that up. Um, I've got two comments, Rick. If memory serves me, elevation where these buildings are proposed is what in relation to Islington Street? Doesn't it go down? It goes down toward Islington Street a little. I believe that road, if you leave Islington Street, it goes down as you go in. Is that yes, correct? Yes, a little bit. Yeah. So, so but, the, but that's but then this is off. The, I'm thinking that I'm looking at these buildings, and I'm I'm thinking about the relative height of the potential buildings. To the actual existing building. So, okay. so in this case, if this is um, if this is one and a half, this is really a, a, a very small small building. So it's actually you know we're talking about a building like that. And my other comment is, that, and what what John brought up is one of, is, has always been one of my concerns that people say, well, 60 feet office research, that's fine. If I'm living on Islington Street, office research is a nine to five. Come six or seven o'clock at night, there's probably not much. Activity or light coming from those buildings, I would imagine, where parking lots, parking lot lights are usually left on. Correct, but again, we, we can, can I think we've done a pretty good job the last couple of years controlling that. But I'm saying that's more of a fixed use than the, you know this potential application is going to be almost 24/7. So, you know, John hit upon one of my concerns that I've always had, but um, I agree. I think buffering. I think there's enough vegetation that we could probably overcome that. So. Cindy? And maybe that's something, <clears throat> I mean, we should look at the site review regs and see if we have enough, you know, oomph there or whether we want to add something additional in here for additional, you know, like you can't cut down the buffer um, just to ensure, because we're envisioning that going, oh, there's big trees there, so they'll be there. Well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. So we might want to take a look at that. Rick, it, 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 is it already in place, or would it make sense to, to institute some sort of no-cut zone? Or I know we're getting more on the site plan than, the, than we are the zoning, but if you've got established vegetation and you just had a flat-out no-cut zone, that that probably does a lot of good for you. Well, it could, but it's it's going to it's going to obviously limit the development potential of the parcel. So it's like it's it's a it, it could be seen as a backdoor way of, of cutting back on. Well, just a suggestion, something to, to keep in mind, I think. Perhaps that's part of the conditional use, so you can look at that to make sure that okay. you've got adequate. I mean, at least I think that's one way to to uh, help that with the lighting. So, John? Or maybe in this ordinance here that we're writing, requiring a buffer zone. Yeah. Well, aren't we in effect by having a 100 foot setback? Well, we, we have a setback, but we yeah. don't have a, we're not requiring a vegetative buffer or some, um, you know, a, a more formal buffer. That should be there. The way we tried to do uh, the RDI, PUD, we did it to affordable housing. We can probably do it to this <laughs> type. Yeah. So, uh, do we want to have the applicant give a quick little uh, overview of some of the questions that we had? If you want to take 10 or 15 minutes, Malcolm. And uh, just hit upon the some of the open-ended items, and then we, or Mark or whomever, um, and uh, that way there we can then. Start up again. We'd like to, we'd like to say at the outset that we very much appreciated an opportunity to meet with the staff 
this week. And so what you're seeing, we have seen most of it prior to your seeing it. And fundamentally, what is being proposed is something we can work with in this ordinance. I'm going to suggest to you that some of the components that you've asked questions about tonight, particularly as it relates to the through traffic, are concerns to us. Uh, by the same token, we've indicated to the, the planning staff that if that is the ultimate direction that you wish to proceed with, we will attempt to proceed in that regard. Well, Malcolm, why don't we just run okay. through? So I hit this to go forward and back. Um, Mark, if you could limit it to 10 or 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, I'll so be very quick, okay, John. thank you. Did we, as Malcolm said, we already met and went through most of this. So we had no problems with this. I know Tony had the question on this first page about the phasing. And um, basically, we'd have to build two buildings at once. But we'd have to get two foundation, you know, two site crews, two foundation crews. Or one, one would open up, um, the assisted in nursing would open up before the independent. I don't see that as a major problem. Um, I, it's a bit of a logistical issue, but not a, not a major problem. I wonder if it could just be handled with an occupancy permit. Just <laughs> right. We couldn't get an occupancy permit on the independent living until we had at least that percentage of the assisted living slash nursing built. Right. And although it's, it's a little bit cumbersome, I think, you know, when we talked to the, the planning staff, we said, you know, that's something we can certainly live with. Um, so that's, I think, the only thing on this first page. Second page was the, the um, buildings, and we had no problems with any of this. We thought this was uh, basically what we showed you on, the, on these pictures. This picture you can see, and we can put, like, the roofs are very, even though it has pitched roofs here, they're still very flat pitch. And what we design these to do is not exceed the height limitations, but still give the feeling of the pitch roof. Um, and we can even, and I didn't have an example that I could find of a four-story building with this, but we could even put dormers, make a four-story in the roof, and put dormers in that roof. Um, so it's a fourth-story, but it's, it's under roof. Um, it looks like it's part of the roof. And I don't know if I'm explaining myself very well, but I think a lot of you have seen that. Mark, I think uh, Rick, Rick had a Mark, question. Just real quick on the height, yeah. can you, could it work with three stories? The, the project, yeah. we would rather do, because we're going to have to put elevators in no matter what, and it leaves more open space, Rick, if we can go to four stories. My vision of this is once we really site plan it, it's going to be a mixture of both. You know, that, that the middle part is going to be four stories and the sides will be three stories and you know it will transition nicely um just to make it not look all the same some build some character build some character in it and that's uh you know in in the whole um, zoning proposal that's uh you guys will be very involved in that in the architectural design of these buildings right rick and david that's that's our deal right any other questions on the, I'm trying to go fast so I get within John's 10 minutes. Um, the parcel boundary in the residential district, 150 feet versus 100 feet. We'd rather have 100 feet. Once again, as Rick said, um, what we're trying to do is put, put landscaping and no parking or parking lights on the Islington Street side. But once again, even though we put this at 100 feet, I think you have the ultimate determination because it's a conditional use permit. If you say, you know, those buildings, in the end, when we really come to the planning board with a final design, those buildings are too close to the, uh, to the neighborhood, then we'll have to move it back. Um, because they've taken out all of Malcolm's good language that he wanted in this. <laughs> Anthony, you got a question? Anthony. <coughs> Mark, do you have much concern about the concept of within that 100 feet, the vegetated buffer, mature growth? I have no problem with that. You know, the no-cut thing, I would rather, rather than no-cut, because that gets really messy and ugly and so forth, I'd rather say, say, 
during the planning process, you know, we're going to put, you, we're going to require you to put up a landscaping buffer. Um, and now, I don't know if we have pictures of Islington Street, but right where that access is, is the closest. The houses are the closest to our land. Then it tails off. Right. And so then it gets, um, in some parts, it's pretty far away. I mean, you know, 150 feet, it's going to be closer to like 300 feet away. And that's not going to be a problem away. The houses are going to be 250, 300 feet away. They're only probably, I, in, you know, I, and don't quote me on this, but probably a dozen, half a dozen houses that are really going to be affected. And then we can do some really heavy planting. So, but rather than a no-cut zone, I'd rather have a, a landscape buffer that is designed and, 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 and landscape designed so it really is a buffer rather than just a bunch of wild weeds and overgrown because both sides are going to have to look at it. Anything else on this? Um, yeah, this is a good example. You can see how it how the houses on the left tail away from, so the houses on the left, and I think it happens on the right as well. So there's only, you know, six, maybe 10 houses that I think are a big, big issue. Mark, is, is the uh, access WBBX Road? That would be, now, as Malcolm said, I, you know, you know our original proposal was that was to be an emergency access. Obviously, we want to do the right thing for planning, and, and we had a long talk with the planning staff. They feel planning-wise, having two roads, and I think we even at one time, Rick and David, tell me if I'm wrong, said we don't necessarily need an access there. We need the ability to put an access there. So the, the compromise might be give us enough land and rights there so if it has to be an access at some future date all the way through that it could be a city street all the way through either way it's okay with us tony uh, um just geography wise i want to know is it is it wbbx road or is it more towards vine street vine street's the street coming um off the bottom the, the, the access point is the that the wb uh, the radio station ro road okay. yeah Um, the other thing you see, the way we designed these, is we had the sides of the buildings closest to the, um, the uh, setback so that the, 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 more, the more troubling, massive elevation, the, the, um, the front elevations or back elevations were, either, you know, were another 100, 100 plus feet away. So that's one of the ways we, and so our feeling is we could really buffer out those sides of those buildings very easily from the neighbors. Um, the open space, we had no um, problem. And the parking spaces being below, that was our intent always is, you know, these are elderly people and we want them to have at least one parking space, those who are driving have the ability to have a car in a dry area during the winter. Um, the access point we talked about. Yeah. Anything else? The, oh, I'm, the, excuse me. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Oh, oh, John, I'm sorry, I'm doing your job. <laughs> Can anyone speak to the, um, use of those two different railroad tracks and whether their use is similar or, I mean, thinking of mm. frequency and... First one is the Hampton branch. That's the one closest to Islington. Yeah. That's the one that is being preserved, but its principal user was FOSS. And there's probably, at best, one train a week down it when it was opening, and there's probably no trains at the moment. However, that is being preserved by the state as an active corridor. The far more busier one is the Rockingham branch, which is one off of Borthwick. That spur that you see heading off of there is actually not used anymore. One that goes sort of the middle of the page and off to the right. The one that's closest to the property is the Rockingham branch. That goes to the junction, and that'll be the rail line that will see development probably right now, three trains a week, 
when the economy is healthy. Uh, but it is an active line. It goes to the shipyard, so that's where that's an important connection. Um, in the public benefit issue, we certainly oh, – I'm pressing wrong buttons again. We certainly – you know, we have this land. We can – we can put an easement, a public benefit easement, and the, the city can decide what they want to do it in the future. We can decide what we want to do now. Certainly, we'd want to put, you know, part of our plan is to put tra walking trails around so that you can come and take Grandma for a walk or, or our Grandpa can go out, Grandpa and Grandma can go out for a walk all by themselves, and people from, you know, the neighborhood and so forth can use those. Rick, did you have a question, Rick? I was just curious from David, which one of those two branches goes into Newington and by Schiller? And Ultimately, by Schiller, both of them. They both, they because both they meet up further down. Up, up in here somewhere, they both meet up. The, yeah. The tracks meet. Okay. You know, you can see the way they head towards each other, and they eventually meet up there. Mm -hmm. So to the left or to the south, you're saying one goes to Rockingham Junction and the other one just dead it evaporates? Well, it heads towards Hampton. Hampton. Yeah. And then on Route 1. The yeah, it way. is a dead end right now. It is. Yeah. But are you, are that you was the Foss connection. Yes. Okay. David, you're suggesting the number is four trains a week? It's probably, yeah, that'd be approximately. You know, just to play the game with the economy this way, I just noticed going by they no longer even have the switcher at the, uh, right. at the Portsmouth station. But when the economy is good, the switcher is there, and they're using it rather regularly up and down the Newington Spur. And is that the four trains a week that you're speaking of in a good economy? Yep. No. No one? A couple of questions. One of them is on the uh, railroad tracks. Are all of these level grade crossings? And do we At, have any? Yes. You know, do we have any provisions there for uh, alerting the senior citizens to that this there's a railroad track? We, we, our agreement, Norm, on the, this crossing, we have a very substantial agreement with um, B&M, right, Malcolm, it's a B&M? Well, whatever they're called. Whatever they're called now. Um, and, and it has signals and it has, you know, all the things that we have to do. It truly, yeah. it truly has all the bells and whistles. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, yes. With respect to the access on Islington Street, I mean, that WBX road is pretty narrow. Um, mm. Is it realistic to have two-way traffic there? We'd have to widen it. Yeah. The issue that was posed is, if it would, is would it be a conforming, city, meet city standards, which would be a 50-foot wide right-of-way? So there would be an issue there. Would it be possible to limit access in both directions to emergency vehicles, but um, access for the residents to Islington Street on the way out only with? I think enforceability would be the big issue. <laughs> Theoretically, you could look at it. John? Cindy? Yeah. Just something that I, I don't know if people are envisioning, uh, you know, in terms of public safety and emergency access. Perfect example, if there's a train going by on the Borthwick and that, that line, mm -hmm and somebody needs to get out of there in an ambulance right away. I mean, that's the sort of thing that, you know, we hear from our public safety officials. That's when we're talking about those two accesses being open all the time to everybody. It's all about that. It's a good point because sometimes, for example, in the yard, uh, they're supposed to notify us when there's a derailment. Yeah. It can be a little slow. But if they – these are not the best of tracks. They meet all the federal standards for the speeds that they do. But they can go off the track, and when they do, it takes a long time to put them on, and that's really where the fire department's coming from. Mm -hmm. It can be long. Yeah. So, any other questions for the applicant? Could I just make a couple of comments? Sure. In terms of some of the language that was found to be offensive that I had added with regard to terms like reasonability and the extent of your control, we've discussed the removal of that language to be consistent with what was proposed before. But I think the important point about that, as you consider this through traffic issue or other issues, is the way this is now presently drafted is, uh, and I'll read the phrase, nothing contained herein shall compel the planning board to approve the, we'll call it the CCRC now, 
while the intent of the section is to provide flexibility with uh, both to the board in considering an application and to the applicant in designing a project, not all parcels are suitable for a CCRC. So in, in terms of whether some of these issues are zoning issues or site review uh, issues, there is certainly very broad authority for you under this being constructed as a CCRC, as a conditional use permit with that kind of authority to exercise significant control. The bottom line, I think, that we would represent to you as evidenced by Mark's uh, comments is, in terms of the list that's been supplied by the staff, we can live with them. There are some components of it that have been generated by the staff that have never been part of where we've been coming from. Uh, particularly as it relates to Islington Street, but we understand the city's concerns. Uh, and uh, we would like to move forward with the CCRC and work with the staff to finalize what we hope you find conceptually to be acceptable. I think the section that you're dealing with right there it sort of emphasizes what we envision the conditional use being, which is a negotiated process True. as you go through. The zoning will be created theoretically is created, the opportunity exists, then you start the negotiations. And I think that's language that reminds everyone that we're trying to find the common balance. We are. And the, the issue in all candor with regard to the issues of possible cut through and the continuous roadway, we've been affected by what we've heard when we've had public meetings in the neighborhoods. And we'll all hear it again as this goes forward. And that those are the public policy issues that have to be resolved in the trade-offs that need to be considered. Mm -hmm. Cindy? It, I guess I just asked the board to keep in mind, and, and the applicant too, is that you've heard from the Islington Street neighborhood because that's who you reached out to. But if we send everybody via Borthwick, we'll probably hear from other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it is that balancing act. Yep. And I, I know what you're saying. You're trying to be sensitive to the... We the, have. You know? yeah. And the other thing too is <coughs> the planning board is representing or considering the interests of the entire city. We, we understand. That's um, a broad we're, we're trying to deal with it. In, you know, we, we've heard from many members of the public, so we know to, to a significant degree how this is going to play out in terms of some public comment. And I think there has to be a rationale for the ultimate decision. Tony? I think that was a great discussion because, I mean, in my mind, somebody on Cottage Street, which is the cut through from Woodbury to Route 1, or even the end of Woodbury going down to Bartlett, when they read this in the newspaper, they're not thinking this affects me. Like, well, this is over there. But that's, that's where we're going to be sending the traffic if, if we had it up at just Borthwick. I think that was a great point that was raised. Our request, Mr. Chairman, is to uh, continue what we think has been a uh, excellent recent dialogue with the staff and try to work toward drafting an ordinance that you can adopt. Okay, and I think, um, Cindy, you had a question for Mark, I, just I believe. I a follow-up question for you, Mark since it was a point you raised, if I can get you to go to the mic, so, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> since we know that, that the height issue is going to be, if it's not yet, a, an issue of concern to the neighborhood, and I know Rick Hoffley expressed concern, and you had mentioned that ultimately you're thinking about a three and four story mix. Is that something you're open to? That Could we capture that thought somehow in this ordinance? Is that something we could work with you on? I <laughs> <laughs> not Boy, to put you I on the spot it. or anything. <laughs> you if, started. if not, mine, mine was coming up I next. I know better Mark, to so. say that stuff in front of you, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> These are Mark's comments. Uh, right. <laughs> what what I would think is that maybe we we have some have some kind of something in there that says if it's between 100 and 150 feet, it's got to be three stories, and anything over 150 feet is four stories. Right, and I'm not looking for a concrete answer right now, but, but just some kind of trade-off. Yes. Or, you know, okay, great. Yes. That, you know, because I Absolutely. think we, if, if, um, if we want community support on that, on this proposal, that might be one way that kind of helps that mm -hmm. come yep. across. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for the applicants? No. Thank, Thank you, Malcolm. You. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Um, I've got a couple comments too, and Cindy just stole half of my thunder. So, um, one of my comments was um, maybe have a, a percentage of buildings need to be less than four stories, and maybe have some sort of waiver or something that if they can show, 
if I go with all four stories, I can save another 15% of open space. So that was one of my comments, is what Cindy just said. And, and my other comment is I, I would I would wholeheartedly support a no-cut zone. Um, if a building setback's 100 feet and we have a 50-foot no-cut, they can buffer from 50 to 100, but it's hard to replace a 20-inch oak tree with design landscaping. And I just think that whole back off of Islington has a bunch of nice mature trees that you're not going to get down at someone's landscaping company. So those are my two comments, that uh, the no-cut zone and the percentage of buildings per story. In all our PUDs, we've done an awful lot on preserving vegetation. We've got a lot of good examples where you can practice good silviculture yep. so that actually you're enhancing the development or the maintenance of the trees. I think we could get an, a model for that that would actually allow for the, the care and maintenance of the area, which is also necessary. Yep. So. Tony? I may have missed it um, in here, but... I was wondering if we could have a requirement under um, Section E, the design standards, to have um, the applicant required to show some um, form of sustainability in their development. Um, it doesn't have to be LEED certified but, um, or LEED certifiable, but you know, what are they doing? You know, I'd like an answer to the question, what are you doing for, for sustainability? Well, you know, we've added that under the site review, not as a requirement, okay. but they need to tell us specifically what okay. they're doing that's green. So I think we'll get that. All right, and do we have, but no, it's a great idea. Do we have bonuses in the language? Not, not for site no, review, not now. No. Just in that one area downtown <clears throat> by, the, by the mill pond. Right. I'm just wondering. I know we did talk about it at a work session many iterations ago about if they did X amount, you know, LEED oh, certified or lead platinum that they could get certain other excuse. incentives. Excuse. I mean, in a proposed. We, we, we talked about it in this, in the, excuse me, we talked about it in the uh, downtown district of the city, so we also talked about it in the gateway district. Uh, okay. but, but, but we haven't talked about it generally across the city. Okay. okay. And, and remember, usually the bonus that you're giving is density, density. which is not what you want right, to give Right, right. But <laughs> I'm just, I think it's important. I think that's a good point, Tony. So did you have a comment, Councilor Dwyer? No, just okay. to that point. ML? I, I just wanted to respond to what Cindy said, because I, I think that if we're going, or if we were prepared to go as far in <coughs> subsection E with requiring pitched roofs, we can certainly require as opposed to um, encourage sustainable building elements wherever possible or something something a little bit more forceful than what our site review regs say. In other words, we've, we've kind of gone out into that site review realm in this zoning ordinance, and I think the sustainability element is, is real important. So I, I would I would argue that we should actually include it. So, Cindy, I, I'm all for sustainability, and you know the city's obviously played a big leadership role in that. But I guess I I don't feel great about making it a mandatory thing at this point because unless that's going to be the public benefit component that we're looking for, because it seems like adding another layer on at a, a late date in the process. You know, we started with housing affordability, we've moved away from that. And to add that in, I, I, I don't know. I that's my thought. I mean, I think you know, we when we were doing the site review regs, I think of what we talked about was getting developers to think early in the development process is really the key thing. And they're going to do if they're going to own and control this, they're going to want to keep their operating costs low, so they're going to incorporate it anyway. Um, but maybe it is. I still, I, 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 um, I have uh, issues with making mandatory green anything at this current point in time, particularly kind of about this, pro why pick on this project or why pick on this CCRC? Well, I'd like to respond to you directly. First, I think to your point, having something in this PUD zoning ordinance about sustainability does exactly what you're saying, which is it raises this issue in the context of our zoning. So just like why it's good, I don't think you have to mandate it, and okay. I would certainly not um, say it must be green or it's going out the window. But I think doing something along the lines of what we did in the site review regs where we're calling okay. the attention to that, especially because here we're doing something mm -hmm. unique. So, Councilor Dwyer? Well, I think there's an interesting opportunity here for something like that. I know I was really interested in what does it mean to have a green fire station? You know, mm. Does it mean something different than um, a green library? And indeed it does. I mean, and you know, once we got the answers to those, those are a whole series of very interesting things that have to do 
with how you clean the equipment and uh, you know where you put sleeping quarters and all this stuff. Similarly, I I think there are probably some very interesting things to think about. What does it mean to have a green CCRC, which probably have to do with uh, light and orientation and some things that might be taken into account anyway. Uh, recreational facilities, vitamin D in the water, you know. Uh, there are probably a whole bunch of things that um, we would learn about what, what are the particulars related to this kind of facility. Because it, green isn't just generic if you think of it in a broader sense. And so I think the discussion would be the interesting discussion and the pushing the envelope a little and what that actually means. Vitamin D in the water was not on my radar yeah. tonight. So. Added to the One thousand the things. things. Added to. I know what's going on your mug. Um, <laughs> any other, uh, John? Can I beat a dead horse? You know, uh, <laughs> Please just, do. Just uh, <laughs> briefly, ever so briefly. But when I think about buffer zones, and this particular buffalo buffer zone that's uh, 100 feet, that's exactly the width of my lot that I live on. So if I stood on one end of it, uh, and there was a large building on the other side of the lot that I live on and had experience on for 20 years, you'd have to be a very clever arborist um, and landscaper and whatever to, to truly do a, a magnificent job of buffering. But I do think that if you added that extra 50 feet, you wouldn't have to be so clever. And, and I think that goes, I think somebody made the comment, if we said, Three stories at 100. Yeah, I like four that. Four at 150. Like, that yeah. just the way this is laid out, I think you can accommodate that where it's easy to enforce. I like that idea, and I do appreciate the design the way it is there, but we're talking about forever here and whatever goes there. Mm -hmm. so. Correct. So, Tony, and then what, ML. North of the parking lot on the right side of the lot here. Page North, I'm not, I'm not sure where real North is or offhand. Um, is that a wetland that is keeping them from moving the parking lot north? Right. Yeah. So, Kamel, did you have a question? Oh, I, I did, but didn't you need an answer? Yeah, I got a nod. Yeah. Oh, a nod. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm back in the design standards. I, I really, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether the board would consider adding a number seven that says something like access to the development um, and the community spaces and facilities within the development shall be situated and designed to encourage meaningful interface between the development and the Portsmouth community. Well, and I'm not, I'm not saying it has to read like that, but I'm, I really am concerned about that intersection. Mm -hmm. That sounds a little too squishy to me. And I think my thought is that my guess is if if they're as intuitive as I think they are, they're probably going to do that anyway. And that's why one of my concerns about going out to Borthwick is it does seem to kind of isolate if you wanted to go to Plains Field and watch a game or you wanted to go down to Coffee Roasters or me and Ollie's to get some bread. I think heading out to Borthwick is probably not going to promote that. So mm -hmm. but that's just my thought. You may have some of that ML2 in the sense that the, under the uh, conditional senior, use criteria. Well, under the senior housing A, it's really referencing that the site's going to meet the uh, the goals of the master plan. And really, what we got in this is the idea that we're a walkable city, uh, that we're recognizing those particular needs. And I think the way the site is oriented, they're going to end up with that. And it's just to what degree do we want to enhance it? Did we get rid of the word housing then? <laughs> Interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. On page uh, two, A. Yeah. Um, ML? And then you might want to say by comma among other things providing for so that we can maybe look at other master plan goals. Yeah. 
And I guess what I'd like to do is where, wherever this ends up going, that, that we just provide uh, the department with enough information that they can, I think Rick's got you on two, page two yet or still on page one? Oh, just one page so far. Oh, um, <laughs> But again, I always say it, it never amazes me when you think you've just about got everything covered that you get one page of, no, oh, it's, it's, you know, the subtle changes and the small comments seem to always make a difference. So, no, I, I think that the, um, obviously, the, there's a lot of consensus on some, some issues, but there's not quite consensus on access and public benefit. I think those are the two things that seem to be most outstanding. And I think it's, it'd be, it's very easy for us to, we come back with a redraft that addresses everything else, and there might be some minor little points that need adjusting. But I think those are the two big issues that are out there right now. I think we've I think we've effectively dealt with things like height and density and coverage and open space and all that sort of stuff. But we're still we still got those two pieces out there: public benefit and and the question about how we deal how to what level of detail we deal with access. And I think those are the two biggest things that you can't you can't put in a box because they're so, to me, so site-specific. that Access on this side is much different than the one next to it. Public benefit for this project could be green space, open space, walking space, where some other place it could be something else. So maybe we just craft a language that, that's kind of somewhat general, but yet, um, I don't know. Those are, those are two of the most difficult, I think, to deal with. Make it general yet specific, Rick. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I want to make it so that everybody can read, ex that they think ex it says exactly what they wanted to read. <laughs> can you have it for next week? So. Tony? Um, where, I'm just curious, uh, where did the minimum off-street parking um, numbers come from? Research on what congregate care facilities need, or uh, these are there. Well, there's there's a, a lot of debate about what parking standards are. You know, what 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 the basis for parking standards are, um, and there's a lot of concern that the, the the standard rates that are used tend to push up parking above what it really needs to be. But these are um, fairly typical across the board kind of uh, kind of rates. I I think that in in an early draft. Um, let me see where we are. Um, I think that I, yeah, I'd had 1.1 spaces per unit and the, uh, um, for, independent. for independent living, and that was meant to accommodate um, the staff, this, this, the independent living units share of staff, and that is actually a rate that has been used in other places. Um, I think if we reduce it to one, there may be a need for visitor and staff spaces. But we can we can look at this. I mean, I think I think the the the, um, the independent we had a we had maybe, uh, maybe a little bit low, but the assisted living and, and nursing maybe a little bit high, and therefore they may balance out. We had either a, an ordinance suggestion or a uh, or a plan come before us where they. They put an area where they could put a parking lot if it was demonstrated. Yes, that they a needed. reserve parking. We actually put that into the into the revised zoning ordinance. Yeah, yeah. It was the PDA. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. I wonder if if, if uh, I wonder what the applicant thinks on on these number of spaces. Is, is their opinion is this high or do they go with lower? It's such a tight site that I think if we, if you if 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 this were coming in after we adopted the new zoning ordinance, we'd have the automatic right. ability to do that. So uh, because we, because we were adopting that, we're, we're proposing that as part, you know, a reduction, the ability to reduce your parking, but to reserve the space for those additional uh, additional spaces. So it's. Um, I was trying to capture yeah. that in here in that short window where yep. it might yep. be. But if, that's, yep. if you don't think it's yeah. necessary. Um, um, your key, though, is going to be this site plan is rather tight. So if you need additional parking, there could be a problem. What I mean is reduce what they have now. Right, but it. Let's say it doesn't work. We could always have provisions for yeah. future. But I think if you look at it, it's pretty tight. So I think you're in good shape right now with the with the existing parking, perhaps reduce it. But everything's driven by the numbers on the site. So, for example, the PHA tends to find that their parking standard doesn't work. They need more. And so we've attempted to balance that. Uh, I think you're pretty good right where you're at. And if you 
have the ordinance so you can do that, that's fine. But just consider that if this doesn't work, your standards were off and you're not going to have much of an ability to expand it further. So I'm confused by that because what, I mean, to take for example this layout now, the furthest parking lot to the right, what if the applicant came before us and said, we've built a lot of these things and we're finding that we're building way too big of parking lots. Can we not build that one now? And if, if you guys, if the department disagrees in a year, we'll build it. Let them gravel it and grass it, and then they can scrape it and prep it or put some future. I, I would agree. Yeah. And I think I can agree with that, but I'm also saying you got to look at your parking standards very carefully because this is really key to the developability <coughs> of that site. I want to look at it carefully, but looking at 1.0 towards per independent living, it's not tangible number to me. It's, it's where did you get this from? You know, I have no idea what that, I don't know how to put my hands around it. So if someone said 1.0 is what Riverwoods is now, you know, that's more. I'm, I'm sure it's based on standards in the industry yeah. that, you know, Riverwoods are the one up in uh, Scarborough. But Rick said the standards are high. They can, they can be high, but I think, I mean, what I'm saying is I think that the, that because we're dealing with ratios and they're just kind of, they're really rough numbers, I, I think that the assisted living half a space per unit is probably high, but the one space per independent living unit might be a little bit low. So I think they balance out. Okay. Anthony. Rick, I was wondering, in terms of the public benefit portion of this, are you doing that under G3, which is on page 5? Are you anticipating drafting a new section? Or? That's what it, I think that's what it would have to be. It would have to be a uh, – well, it could be under G – it could be under G3. But I think, I think it would be more – rather than being a criterion of the you – know, lumped under the, um, the conditional use permit criteria. I think it should be, if you're going to require it, it should almost be under, maybe under E or something like that, you know, sort of an amenity of the development, something that's, if you're going to require it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan or a supporter of the public benefit and the stuff we've talked about in terms of the public access, the recreational fields, and I, I mean, I don't want to sort of bring up this topic again, but I, I do think the idea of sustainability as part of that public benefit analysis is should be considered. I, I would view that as a public benefit. If this project does things or goes extra steps to be sustainable, you know, green roofs, solar, how they deal with light or water, things like that, I, I think that would be a public benefit that, that I would want to see considered. Mm -hmm. oh, Councilor Dwyer and then but Paige. Another type of public benefit to, uh, to expand the kind of examples here, when you think of that property and the pressure that is increasing around it, you know, with the expansion of Route 33, the Target uh, 95, the expansions of Pease and all that, there is some real public benefit in, in having some wild space there that is not necessarily planned as a recreation, uh, an active recreation, but it's just passive recreation. And I think we ought to acknowledge that and think about that. Um, I, you know, the, the value that people place on, like the Jones Avenue area for that point, has become really amazing as I think people are beginning to realize the value of having that kind of space, and that's the value of not over-landscaping it, but really leaving it wild it, in the proximity to our city, let alone for wildlife and other purposes. But it, the pressures coming toward that area I mean, that whole area coming into the city is changing, and it's going to be paved over more, and it's going to have a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of more traffic already. So it has a different kind of meaning, I think, than we might even ascribe to it right now. Okay. I think that's a very good point. You have the, the conservation land value. You have the active recreation, and then you have passive recreation. The, those distinctions are important, and they're all they're all possible Before, there. Right. Yeah. Oh, Paige, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, sort of drill down a little bit into what she's saying and, and just be a little more specific about the fact that, um, I guess for me, tying some of these comments together, what that means is, for instance, not uh, having fertilizer. So having, you know, the problem with a playing field is it's got to be that whole flat, perfect grass thing going on, which I assume means lots of manipulation <laughs> right so you know that's the that's the magic of of the wild or the passive recreation vis-a-vis -vis the sustainability and the proximity to the great bog for instance um and i would agree that sustainability in some one form or another you know and as you said this is a case-by-case -case thing and it can take any number of forms but 
um, I mean, some kind of some kind of open space that really, you know, is going to minimize pavement, for instance, minimize these roofs that we're going to have this runoff, all those issues that we just struggle with every single meeting. Let's just keep as much of this really open as possible. Yeah, I'd like to keep the uh, the public benefit of somewhat squishy. I mean, the, this is one of the instances where I'd rather be a little generic than too specific, where if we're generic, we've got the control. Where if you get too specific, maybe you're missing something. So that was just my ML. I, I just was looking down at my notes when you said sustainable. Up, up in F3, um, putting all the utilities underground. Rick, I, I like that, but um, what if we said other than solar and wind generation facilities or something like that, just so that, again, it's more putting in this thing, the concept that those things might be okay? Not that they're required, but so that you start to see that more in our ordinance. That's a good point. Any other comments or questions or? Um, just one thing in terms of the, I'm just doing some calculations here, just in terms of the open space, the issue of open space as a public benefit. Um, the, the, all the upland area right now is being calculated as part of the required land area per, per dwelling unit, essentially. So in a sense, you, you don't, you don't call that, that isn't an additional to, talk, to call it public benefit is I mean it's, it's nice that it's available to the public but it's already being required as open space so it's something to you know think about your, your the, the public benefit would not be providing the open space not be it would not be providing the the um, undeveloped area it would be providing public access to an area that they're required to provide anyway right and <clears throat> that's a good point on that um, page 5 G3 portion of the site should be set aside for community purposes. Maybe it should say and public access. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me just catch this first. Um, and public access. Okay. Good. Um, I was just I was just looking at the computations in terms of land area per independent living unit, assisted living unit, and nursing care unit. And they basically, when you multiply them out, you need 25.4 acres of uplands uh, to do this development. So I was just saying that you, it would be, you'd be double counting things to say that providing that area, to preserving that area as open is a public benefit. What's the public benefit is actually providing public access to the open area. So I, mean, I, I, I wanted to be clear about it, that that area has to be kept open anyway under the density requirements. And, and so the space is there. The space is there. So it's providing public access to it is, the, is the public benefit. And then, and then Cindy's, Cindy followed up by saying that, that uh, providing land for community pur purposes with public access, or pu community access, yeah. Or public access. Public right. access, yeah. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions or? No? Um, and again, I just reiterate the, uh, I do like the setback versus height. I, I do think that was a good idea. So um, that was all that I had. So any other last comments or Cindy? Just a <clears throat> kind of a question on, so does staff feel like staff has enough guidance now on being able to take this draft, revise it, and then the intent would be to come back to the board and to the proposers with a new clean draft. Sure. And we make sure we finalize any bugs and then presumably next step would be to hold a, another public hearing on that draft. Yes. I mean, you're, it, we're leaving some things wide open, but I think, you know. But I think some you need yeah, to. Okay. I, I really do. Yep. Um, we're certainly ready to proceed to the next step and yes. then define what yeah. might we don't still need be out there. That, do we? Just a no. consensus? And I don't think so. Six, Is that the yeah. consensus of the board? That's what we want to do. I think, you know, it's getting, the room's getting kind of quiet, and I think we've, well, I think everybody's made their comments. I think they're all good. Um, 
And just a follow-up question to that then, it, that next meeting that we have on this draft, do we need to be in work session format or do we want to do that as part of a regular meeting? I, or I would prefer to do it as part of a regular meeting. I think we've work session this to death. I agree. So I don't know if it's so is it probably a June meeting. The June meeting, yes. Is that is that a good consensus with the board that I think we've I think we're getting down to the nitty gritty and I think it's time to to move it forward. So okay, great. Thank you. So no motions yep. needed. No. No. Any other f final yeah, comment? One motion is needed. Adjourn. Uh, do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Thank you. Good night.